You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech, the Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Dessa Carey, who's the author of the book called The Epigenetics Revolution. And uh, epigenetics is an up-and-coming area of, uh, of science. It's super interesting. So, Dessa, thank you for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here, Richard. Yeah, just start with the basics, if you would. What is uh, epigenetics? So, epigenetics is a scientific discipline that investigates and explains an awful lot of things that can't be explained by genetics alone. Um, The thing that it really investigates is why it can be that you can have two things that are genetically identical, i.e. they have exactly the same DNA script, and yet those two things may be different from one another. So, examples would be identical twins who get different as they age, But it would also be things like all the cells in the human body, which are very, very different from one another. I mean, eyeballs are very different from your liver. And yet the cells that make up those organs have exactly the same DNA sequence as each other. So epigenetics is the discipline that looks at how we can explain why the DNA script alone is not enough to explain the biological outcomes. So that's how it used to be described. It was always described based on these phenomena, but we now also describe it based on what we understand is happening at the DNA level, where epigenetics basically refers to another layer of information that is added to the DNA script, um, often in response to environmental stimuli, and which can really influence how cells behave and how organisms respond to their environment. So it's got this odd kind of two-layered interpretation, but in both cases, the word comes from the Greek. Epi just means at, on, in addition to, as well as. So it's the science of what's happening in addition to the genetic script. So is epigenetics what's responsible for cell differentiation in a person as the growth of a zygote? That's a really good example. So the single cell zygote, which is formed when the egg and the sperm fuse, that DNA script that's in there is the same DNA script, which is in all of the 70 trillion cells that are basically found in the adult human body. But as the zygote, as that cell divides to form two cells and then four and then eight and 16 and 32 and so on, different epigenetic information is added to the genetic information. And that will take cells down different developmental pathways and it will keep them in different developmental pathways. So if you look at two cells from the human body, from the same human, they will have the same DNA script, the same basic genetic information, but the epigenetic information in those cells will be very different. And that's what's basically maintaining their different cellular identities. So how is DNA changed through epigenetics? What are the mechanisms? So it's changed in two ways. One is by direct modifications to the DNA itself, which is basically almost all the time it's addition of what's called a methyl group, which is one carbon atom and three hydrogen atoms. And if the DNA in particular regions gets a lot of this methyl group added to it, it tends to switch off the genes in those regions and it can keep them switched off for our entire lifetime. But there's also another layer of information because DNA doesn't just float around in the cell nucleus as um, an unaccompanied molecule. It is also highly structured around proteins, and these proteins are called histones. And the histones can also be modified with additional information, epigenetic information. And the type of information, the kind of chemical marks that get added to these histones, 
are really complex. There's at least 60 different ones which can be added and they can be added in all sorts of combinations. That in turn also influences how nearby genes are expressed. And the important thing really about this epigenetic information is that when a cell divides, this information can be passed on. And so that's one of the reasons why cell types only give rise when they divide to other cell types like themselves. But it also means that cells continue to respond to the environment in the same way as the parent cell. So it's a very sophisticated way of controlling gene expression. The modifications to the DNA act almost like an on and off switch. The ones to the proteins, the histone proteins, are much more like a volume switch. So they act like a fine tuning of gene expression. How do you visualize DNA DNA in a more accurate way than just a double helix just sitting there naked? Yeah. um, So we know it can't. We always knew it couldn't really be like that, because apart from anything else, a human cell contains about two meters of DNA, a very thin two meters, but two meters of DNA. And the nucleus of a cell that the DNA is packed into is only about a thousandth of a millimetre across. So we know that the DNA has to be much more structured in order to fit into that nucleus. What we actually have is the eight, the histone proteins, you get eight of them in a cluster. And if you can imagine, say, um, eight ping pong balls stacked four on top of another four, that's kind of what the histone cluster looks like. And the DNA wraps around that and then wraps around another eight ping pong balls and another eight ping pong balls. So it, it's kind of like having um, it's like having a piece of string constantly wrapped around clusters of these eight ping pong balls. And that's the essential structure in DNA. And in some regions, that structure is quite sort of strung out. There's a reasonable bit of space between the clusters of ping pong balls. In others, where you get very heavy levels of modification epigenetically to the DNA, those regions get very, very compacted. So you get lots of those clusters of ping pong balls basically scrunched up on top of each other. And that really represses gene expression and will repress it for however long you're alive unless something dramatic happens. When a cell divides, though, doesn't it have to expose all of its DNA to be copied? And then I guess it crunches back up again? It does, and it crunches back up again really quickly. Um, When a cell is copying its DNA, immediately after the DNA has been copied, really, the daughter cells both re-establish the same patterns of modification to the DNA. So they both end up with the same epigenetic modifications as the parent cell had. And that drives this scrunching up all over again. So the pattern gets passed on. Do we know what causes a methylation or a you know, histodeacetylization, or and then how is that preserved in cell division? What are the signaling molecules to do this? That's a great question. The way that it's preserved in DNA with this uh, methyl group, the one carbon three hydrogens, is really well understood. We know that when DNA is copied, that each of the daughter cells receives one of the original strands of DNA because DNA is double stranded. And we understand really clearly the proteins and enzymes involved in being able to read the original epigenetic template on DNA and to reestablish that same epigenetic information really quickly. Um, That's very clearly understood. It's a really well elucidated mechanism. What we are much less certain of is how it is that when histone proteins are passed on when the cell divides, because the cell will pass on half of the histone proteins to each daughter cell. We have much less understanding of how the daughter cells re-establish those histone modifications in the right place. Um, And in fact, that's one of the big mysteries in epigenetics is exactly how the cell knows where to put modifications on histones and which histones to modify and how that process gets reproduced when a cell divides. So that's one of the really big question areas in epigenetics. We know it happens, but we're very unclear on the mechanisms. Yeah, it seems like there's a baseline um, modification to differentiate cell types, and then there's an additional one to adapt and respond to environment, you know, as you go throughout your life. Yeah, I think that's a very good way of looking at it. Um, The very, very heavy DNA methylation that leads to this scrunching up of regions of the genome, that's 
intimately involved in how cells differentiate and how they stay differentiated. Because if you look at the pattern of those very heavy modifications in, say, um, a, a skin cell again versus a bone cell, they'll have very different patterns of those modifications. Because, and that's why skin cells are different from bone cells. So that's really important for maintaining cell types. And it's important that that's stable. We don't want the wrong tissues developing um, inside other organs. But it's really important that the epigenetic system also has a degree of flexibility in it because otherwise individual cell types can't respond to their environment. So it's likely that particularly the histone modifications are very intimately involved in how we respond, how our cells and the cells of all other organisms respond to the environment. They act, as I mentioned earlier, like a, a kind of volume switch. Um, but another way of thinking of them is that they are the link between nature and nurture. They're how the genes and the environment react to one another. They're that missing link between what's integral to the cell and what's happening outside it. So I know that people's DNA can be sequenced, but what about their epigenetic pattern? Can that be seen in the different types of cells in your body? It, yeah, it can. It's um, Again, it's relatively straightforward to do this for the modification that's on the DNA itself. The problem with trying to do it for the histone proteins is that the techniques are not as sensitive. And also there is more than one modification that you would need to look at. Um, so that makes life difficult because there are at least 60 different modifications. Also, the sensitivity of the technique makes it very difficult to be certain that any, at any one spot on the human genome, any one position, that you have ex worked out what the combination of epigenetic modifications is on the histone proteins. You can, for example, analyze the genome for one particular histone modification, such as a histone acetylation event, but it's very difficult formally to demonstrate that if you combine that data with data from looking at another histone modification, that you're looking at exactly what's happening at the same position in the genome. The other problem, of course, is that sequencing someone's genome is actually quite straightforward because the genome is static. It doesn't change between cells, except when something fairly catastrophic happens. But the epigenome, by its definition, is quite dynamic. So you are only looking at a snapshot in a particular cell type in a particular time. So it makes it much more difficult to be certain that what you're looking at is the genuine picture in one cell of one cell type at any particular time. Well, when you consider a stem cell of a given cell type, does it still have the baseline epigenetic markings, but it's just missing the environmental ones? Does that um, make it a stem cell, or what makes it a stem cell for the argument type of tissue? Sure. Um, so the most the most spectacular stem cell, really, in the way, is the zygote. It's that single cell um, from the egg and the sperm, and that's because that can actually differentiate to form all of the tissues in the body plus the placenta. After that, the most stem cell, like of all stem cells, is the embryonic stem cell called the ES cells. And we could talk about them having a baseline, but a baseline isn't necessarily quite the right way to think of it because it almost suggests that there is a starting point and there is an ending point, and there isn't. There's kind of a cycle of cell differentiation. Um, but what you can see is that there are certain patterns of DNA modifications which are associated with a cell having stem-like properties. And there are others which are much more characteristic of fully differentiated cells. So it's not like a um, a bone cell and a bone stem cell. I, I would think that the bone stem cell just has less epigenetic modifications than a bone cell that's completely differentiated and not a stem cell. Is it? Is that how it is or it's not necessarily that way? Not, it's not necessarily how it is. Um, a lot of work has been done by something called the International Human Epigenome Consortium, which has been profiling the epigenetic information for lots of different cell types. Um, and it's not just the amount of epigenetic information that differentiate, sorry, that distinguishes stem cells from differentiated cells. It's also what those types of modification are and where they are on the genome. So um, methylation and, you know, the other kinds of epigenetic 
alterations, do they ever alter the sequence of DNA? Or do no. they only just allow access to it or block access to parts of it? They allow and they block access. They never change the DNA sequence. Um, and so what they do is they influence how and when and how much a gene is expressed, but they never change the basic sequence of what that gene is. And that's why you pass on, when you create eggs or sperm, the egg or sperm contains a faithful copy of the DNA from the parent. Um, the epigenetic information is additional information. Um, if we use the DNA script as an analogy, it's like the epigenetic information is like post-it notes on top of a piece of written work. They don't change what's written on the page. And I would think um, in the creation of germ cells that, you know, all the marks that uh, are associated with cell differentiation are wiped away because you need to start with a zygote that is not differentiated, but are other epigenetic marks preserved? It seems like yeah. at least some are preserved, are acquired and preserved to the next generation. They are. So sperm and egg cells have a particular set of epigenetic marks, which basically allow them to function as sperm and egg cells. Um, and when they fuse to form the zygote, that's particularly a stage where lots of epigenetic information is wiped away, but not quite all of it. Um, it's very important in mammals that certain stretches of DNA come preloaded in the zygote with epigenetic information, which basically highlight if the gene was inherited from the mum or from the dad, because most of our genes, we have two copies, one from each parent. And there's about 100 regions in the human genome where it's really important that this information is present. If it goes wrong, if the epigenetic information saying I'm from mum or I'm from dad goes wrong, it can have really quite spectacular clinical consequences. Um, and it causes what we call imprinting disorders, where the DNA is incorrectly imprinted with epigenetic information. Um, Colin Farrell, for example, has a child who has an imprinting disorder. So although most epigenetic information is wiped away, there are these important regions called the imprinted regions where actually it's vital that information is retained um yeah it's just it's strange what 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 do you think I mean, what do you think governs epigenetics how you know let's say i start smoking i would bet that it causes a whole host of epigenetic changes but how mechanically might that happen what what instructs the dna to allow itself to be changed and to be methylated or this or that to happen how do you think that works we are um we're still, unfortunately, really hazy on a lot of the details of how environmental changes create or drive epigenetic changes. One thing that seems quite likely is that there's a kind of circularity between gene expression and epigenetic changes. So if, if you start doing something new or a new stimulus hits your cells, it will set up signaling changes within the cell. Um, so, for example, the one we're all familiar with is if you start eating lots of sugary foods, your pancreas starts creating lots of insulin and your um, cells in muscle, for example, start taking up much more sugar in response to that insulin. So we know that there are mechanisms in cells that drive an immediate reaction to a new stimulus. That then changes gene expression. And this is where it all becomes a bit circular. So those signaling mechanisms in the cell start driving changes in gene expression, partly based on the binding of small proteins called transcription factors to DNA. When the expression of the genes starts to change, that also changes, in many cases, the type or the amount of epigenetic information on the cells that are being actively expressed. That, in turn, can then make those genes more epigenetically susceptible to changing their expression again when the same stimulus comes around. So we have this sort of circle where the more gene expression there is, the more epigenetic change you get. And the more epigenetic change you get, the more likely it is that the gene expression will change. So it's, <clears throat> but one of the issues is that it's very, very rare that we have all of the information that we need to understand the exact sequence of events. And that's partly because of a limit on the technology. We know the questions that we want to ask, but many of these questions rely on looking on at things like 
very, very tiny amounts of proteins or other chemicals or um, molecules in cells. And many times our technologies are not good enough to do that at the moment. So we can hypothesize, but it's quite difficult to test these questions at the moment. Yeah, you wonder why some, like, you know, the Dutch starvation winter, you know, during World War II, it, it, it affected the children and grandchildren of those people. But, you know, if I, I don't know, again, if I smoke cigarettes and then stop and have kids, it doesn't seem to affect them, for instance. So it's, or if I'm a weightlifter, you know, and my kids are not necessarily in big muscles, it, it, no. it's strange that some changes are heritable and some are not. And I don't know if we know why. We don't know why. Um, and it's incredibly difficult to investigate in humans um, because we're a terrible experimental species because we're all genetically very different from one another. And we have very different environmental um stimulate most of the time. So things like the Dutch hunger winter are actually quite anomalous in terms of what normally happens in humans. We do know from animal studies, for example, in mice or in rats, that if you change the diet very drastically in the parental generation, so in male rats or female rats who are going to have, um, who are going to create offspring we do know that if you start messing around with the diet quite spectacularly that you start seeing changes in for example the metabolism of the offspring and in some cases of their offspring and we can see that this is not happening through changes in dna because it's happening at far too high a rate and we can see that it is actually being passed on and it kind of makes sense as an environmental response to give the offspring a, a better chance of surviving in what the body assumes is going to be an abnormal nutritional environment. One thing that was really odd is that the expectation with these experiments was that the regions that would be carrying the epigenetic information that had been passed on would be those imprinted regions that I talked about, but it doesn't seem to be the case. So we don't really know how this information is passed on. We know that in certain situations, you can spot that there are unusual epigenetic modifications in the parent, rat or mouse, and in the offspring. Um, and it's very tempting to say, ah, they've passed on the epigenetic information. They may not have done it directly. It may have been that um, they passed on, for example, this information in terms of things like other molecules within the sperm or the eggs and that then the epigenetic information got re-established. So there's an awful lot of black box work here at the moment. We know that in certain specialised circumstances, epigenetic information is passed on from parent to child, and you can demonstrate this in all sorts of species. But we are very poor at, at being able to unravel exactly how that is happening. And in humans, it's usually massively overstated as a phenomenon. Um, for most humans, it's probably not actually that important in the great scheme of things. I guess when um, you know a female of whatever animal species is pregnant, that's the time where the fetus is probably most susceptible to uh, epigenetic change. It, it, it influences the mother, influences the fetus. It, it certainly is. Um, in We know that in humans, for example, the first trimester is incredibly important for the health of the resulting baby and the health of the adult. So there is this um, concept called the fetal origins of adult disease, which basically means if the mother has perhaps for whatever reason, a very unhealthy lifestyle, maybe she doesn't have enough access to good nutrition, that that can set up a pattern of gene expression in the fetus, which means the fetus's responses to nutrition will also be abnormal. Um, and that can affect a, an individual for life. That's, it's very likely that those abnormal changes are actually a result of epigenetic modifications. It doesn't necessarily mean the mother passed them on, though, because if the mother's experiencing something, then the fetus is as well. In animals, we can see again that it's a, it can be a quite significant stimulus and there may be direct passing on of epigenetic information. But if what you want, really want to look at is if the response of adults to a stimulus gets passed on to their offspring. You really need to do this in species like um, fruit flies or mice 
or microscopic worms that we use all the time. And you pretty much always in mammals do this by changing things in the paternal line, not the maternal line. So you expose the fathers or grandfathers or whichever generation you want to think of, you expose them to the stimulus. You don't do it through the maternal line. And that's because in the maternal line, it's really difficult to sort out if you're seeing direct epigenetic transmission or you're seeing, say, changes to the uterine environment. It's very difficult to work out what the mechanism is there. Yeah, interesting. Uh, epigenetics itself, it seems to be contrary to the part of the you know, neo-Darwinism that says uh, random mutations are responsible for uh, for evolution. It seems like this is I mean, this is pure adaptation within the life and across the generations. I mean, how do you reconcile the two in your mind? Um, I, I have no problem reconciling the two. Um, Darwinian evolution and the um, the origin of species and the whole process of natural selection in you know, the vast amount of the biological kingdom, the vast amount of the time, that's exactly what's happening. You're getting the development of random um, select, yeah, sorry, a natural variation, which will be through random genetic differences. And if that gives an organism an advantage, it will probably have more offspring. And so that change will be passed on. And that's what's happening almost all the time. It's very clear, however, that in certain specialized circumstances, you do get epigenetic information passed on as well. So you're absolutely right. That is a kind of neo-Lamarckism. It is the inheritance of acquired characteristics. I don't think it undermines the Darwinian model at all. I think it's a, a tweak to the Darwinian model. Um, and I think what it generally is has evolved to do is to give the offspring a hopefully slight advantage or even a big advantage would be great when they're born with the kind of evolutionary assumption that what they're about to encounter are abnormal circumstances, such as a period of um, lack of access to food. So by using the epigenetic system, what biology is doing is basically giving those organisms that can pass on useful epigenetic information a bit of an advantage. Um, but that advantage typically in most of the experiments that have been conducted dies out after a few generations, which is kind of what you'd expect, because you, biologically speaking, geologically speaking, conditions tend to be stable over the long term. So I think this is a kind of tweak to the Darwinian system. It allows for immediate adaptation, but without the danger of changing the underlying genetic script, which has evolved typically over millions or tens of millions of years and is generally speaking the script which for a particular species is most useful for most of the organisms most of the time. So I, I think it's just a tweak. I know people get very exercised about it, but I always think Darwin was the most consummate data-driven scientist. I can't imagine he'd be that bothered. If the data is showing us something, I kind of suspect Darwin would be saying, "You, know, here it is, this is happening, now let's find an explanation for it. But I don't think it undermines the fundamental applicability of the Darwinian model. Well, if, if you consider, um, you know, global climate change, could you reason maybe that's going to cause a persistent epigenetic change in us? And then over time, maybe that would affect the underlying DNA at some point, maybe lead to speciation. Do you think that that's happened maybe in the in the Earth's history? Um, I think it's there's a very slight possibility of that. Um, I think when you look at the amount of variation which exists, for example, in the human genome, it's probably already enough to compensate for those kind of big global changes. And if it isn't, I doubt that the epigenetic system will be enough to save us. Um, it's It may, you're absolutely right in that if the stimulus continues for a long time, you would expect to see that there is an advantage to having these epigenetic modifications passed on. But one thing that we have to remember is that the epigenetic system by its very nature is dynamic. Um, so although changes happen a lot and we tend to focus on the ones which are useful, we can also have changes happening quite spontaneously, which will be countering that and may not be useful at all. So if I'm looking for um, my best chances of survival, I'm still going to be betting on the genetic rather than the epigenetic system in terms of passing on to offspring. It, it is kind of out of left field, but you know, I was just 
I forget about the microbiome. Um, do we think that, you know, the microbes that are commensal with us, do you think that they're able to instruct us or uh, help us to adapt, you know, help us to accumulate certain epigenetic changes based on the uh, microbes that we have within us? Yeah, I think that that would almost inevitably become the case that we will discover that. Um, one of the things, though, that's a nightmare is how to handle the vast amounts of data that both epigenetic information, uh, epigenetic experiments generate, and then you couple that with the amounts of data that microbial um, analyses generate. So what we have is an explosion of data, and trying to turn those data into useful information is really difficult. But I think it's inevitable there will be crosstalk between the two systems, um, some of which will be through mechanisms we can't even envisage at the moment, but others will be because... For example, certain bacteria produce chemicals, um, one of them is called butyrate, which we already know can influence the epigenetic system quite dramatically. So I think we'll see a lot of correlations. What we'll have trouble doing is unraveling the correlations from actual causative relationships. Um, and again, we need not to fall into the trap of trying to think everything runs in a linear fashion from A to B to C to D onwards. I think what we'll see is that there will be, for example, compounds produced by the microbes living inside us, which change the epigenetic system, but also the epigenetic system itself will influence which microbes thrive within us. So I, we'll have a huge amount of crosstalk, but it will be a nightmare to try and unravel all that data. Well, then to make it even simpler, what about endogenous retroviruses that are inserted into our DNA? So, Legend uh, has it, I guess, what, 8 to 10 percent of our DNA supposedly is... Uh, endogenous retroviruses? Yeah, absolutely. We carry around a vast historical document within our DNA of all the viruses we've been, that the human race has encountered over time. Um, and there, there's enormous quantities of them lying in our DNA. Some of them are completely non-functional. You know, their sequences have just become degraded. They're probably never likely to be a problem. But there are others that can be reactivated in one way or another they won't necessarily become full viruses but what they can start doing is basically moving about in our genome and disrupting gene expression the epigenetic system is incredibly important to keeping these under control um, it's one of the things that we are now starting to realize it does is it basically keeps these endogenous retroviruses silenced um, and so it's one of the reasons why in developing new drugs that target epigenetic mechanisms, we have to be very careful that we don't start doing things like reactivating these kind of sleeper agents, which are sitting in our DNA. Oy, it's so complicated. It's insane. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is utterly insane. And it's only very, very recently, really, we've had the molecular tools to allow us to look at any of this um, so in the past, the epigenetic system tended to be ignored a bit um, simply because it was too difficult to engage with. Um, biologists, we're really, really bad for if we don't know what something does, we pretend it does nothing um, or we just ignore it. And we just pretend that um, we've made a conscious decision. But often it's just we do the experiments we can. So what are some of the major research arms in epigenetics that you're seeing out there? Um Certainly where all the money is, is in drug discovery with epigenetics. Um, it's very attractive to try and modify the epigenetic system to treat human disease. And there's already been success with this. There are drugs licensed which are very good at controlling certain types of cancers. And they work by actually changing the way the epigenetic system is working. But it's becoming very clear that for quite some time now, the pharmaceutical industry has been trying to work on um, other aspects of the epigenetic system to create new therapies originally for cancer, um, because cancer is the big thing that's actually easiest to try and treat epigenetically. Um, we know, for example, that about 15% of cancers, the epigenetic system has gone really, really crazy. So we think the epigenetic system may be driving some of those cancers. But also long term, the epigenetic system may be involved in many of the conditions which are actually crippling health, health services throughout the world. And these are the chronic conditions. These are the conditions that you develop and may stick with you for 20, 30, 40 years. So things like type 2 diabetes or um, we could also look at things like heart disease, 
any of the neurodegenerative conditions such as Alzheimer's. We really don't understand why those diseases take such a long time to develop. And once they've developed, why they persist and why the person remains affected by them for so long. And a very attractive hypothesis is that in those conditions, there's nothing wrong with the genetic system. We know there's nothing wrong with the genetic system. The DNA is fine. But it's a very attractive hypothesis that actually what's gone wrong is that the genetic information is being badly used. It's being expressed in the wrong way, possibly because it's developed a pattern of epigenetic modifications which have gone wrong. If you can reverse that abnormal pattern of epigenetic modifications, the hope is you can either stop the disease from progressing or maybe even reverse it. And that's where we're seeing the biggest amount of research funding going into this. Billions have been spent by various pharmaceutical and biotech companies and their investors. In the academic field, we've seen a lot of money spent on characterizing exactly which modifications are present at any time on any organism. Um, but also we've seen the work on the inheritance of these epigenetic characteristics and we're starting to see people moving into particularly things like epigenetics in the brain and how the brain works but again the brain is a fantastically complicated organ to work in um, and so that works at its infancy but I think we're going to start seeing really big developments in that field probably in about 10 years time. Yeah, and going back a little earlier are we able to use imaging to see uh, you know the histone patterning of DNA? Um, we can't really, we can use imaging to a small extent, but it gives us a very crude picture. Um, so you can just show, for example, that a cell nucleus has very high levels of a particular type of histone modification, but you wouldn't be able to see which genes that was on. The kind of analysis that we do much more is basically an adaptation of the DNA sequencing analysis, because that gives us much more detailed information and it gives us much more quantitative information. And of course, scientists always like being able to measure. I guess it would be interesting to um, you know to see someone's epigenetic marks and how they change over a period of time or again, in response to various stimuli, yeah, know, smoking, it, exercising, diet, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, it's, and we can do that. Um, and there are already people doing things like looking at what happens when some, when people exercise. Um, and there was a, a very um, flashy, although I'm not convinced, particularly meaningful experiment done in this, which was basically identical twins where one was up in um, the space station and the other was on Earth. And their epigenetic information was analyzed before and after to see how they changed. Um, the problem is that there are so many variables in that situation. So it's very difficult to say, oh, look, if you go to space, this is what happens to you epigenetically. Um, but one of the things we, we are starting to see is that people are now starting to publish profiles of you know, if lots of people do lots of exercise, we see these consistent changes to their epigenetic system. Now, of course, it's always difficult to demonstrate that those changes are anything other than just markers of something happening. They might be telling you that certain genes are being perhaps switched on, which are helpful, but they might just be telling you that the person was doing a lot of exercise. So it's very difficult to be sure that we're getting information that allows us to make decisions. Um, and I think we'll see a lot more of these kind of studies coming out, but they're really quite challenging to interpret. You have to be incredibly careful in this field. It is a field where absolutely association does not imply causation. That's true throughout all of biology. Um, but you find with a field that is hyped, such as the microbiome or such as epigenetics, there are terrible tendencies to say we've seen a change. Therefore, it has been caused by the following stimulus or it will lead to the following effect. And actually, it, it's quite challenging to do that. And we've seen big reports recently of a tiny trial that was done with three common drugs and less than 10 participants, I think. And the claim was that after taking these drugs, epigenetic markers of aging showed that the patients were biologically two and a half years younger than they had been when they started the trial. Now, in that kind of experiment, which was done with humans, there are so many unknowns and so many conflicting variables and so many assumptions built in that we have to be, a, I think, 
rightly a little sceptical when we see these sorts of claims. This is kind of a general thing, but do you get the feeling that science or biology will be irreducibly complex to the point where you can't, I mean, if progress will be so slow, it'll just go nowhere unless you uh, are willing to make big leaps or, I mean, be um, okay with confounding variables in order to make progress? I think we have an assumption at the moment that we will be able to deal with all the confounding variables because of the approaches of big data and artificial intelligence. I'm not completely convinced that that's necessarily going to be the case. Um, I think those approaches are going to be very valuable, but we do still need to nurture the generation of scientists who can develop a hypothesis and test that hypothesis in a very precise and controlled way. Um, I also think you know, there does come a point when you start seeing so many domains of data that you can see that the complexity of a system expands exponentially, and that will make things very difficult in terms of drawing conclusions. I think also we have to be very aware of what are the questions that we're asking. Um, so if you think about things going on in the human brain, the human brain is probably the, the quote I always use, I'm afraid I can't remember who it's from originally, is that the human brain is the most complex one and a half kilos of matter in the universe. Um, and thinking that we will be able to unravel everything about the human brain, I, I am not entirely convinced. I certainly don't think it will happen in my lifetime. So I think we have the ability to generate vast amounts of data. We struggle to convert that into meaningful information. And we need still to be very, very good at asking the right questions, not just collecting a load of data. Well, very good. Um, last question or two. When is your research about, like, where is it going to go from here? What area of epigenetics do you want to hang out in in advance? So these days, I'm absolutely a, um, a voyeur in the field. Um, I watch what other people are doing. I'm sadly not doing any research in this myself anymore because I no longer work for the drug companies. Um, so I keep my geek on by continuing to engage with the scientific community and being um, a part-time writer, basically. Um, I would really like to see this field making progress in really identifying the right patients who will benefit from the right drugs targeting the epigenetic system, because that's kind of all through my working life. Um, as a professional scientist, the thing that I was most excited about doing was doing stuff that would make an improvement to human health. So that's kind of where I would like to see the field going. And I look at some programs and drugs which are in the clinic now, and I know that somewhere along the line, I played a small role in helping them get there. Um, and that's a great feeling. So that that's the area that I'm most interested in seeing. Well, that's great. Well, I, I know uh, I got a copy of your book on Audible, so I know it's available on Amazon and Kindle and Audible, which yeah. is really good. A lot of these science books are not available in audio format. So I'm glad yours is. Yeah, what, what's an, another good way. Yeah, what's another good way for people to get in touch or ask questions? Um, to ask me questions or to ask questions generally? Uh, to ask you, possibly ask you questions. Uh, is there a forum where people, if they want to ask you questions about your book or about epigenetics, yeah. that they can? Uh, Absolutely. So I have a website, which is just nessacary.co.uk. Um, and on that, that's got various contact details for me. So I'm contactable by a um, mail and also on Twitter, of course. So I'm always delighted to hear from people. I, I love it when people get in touch to ask questions. Um, and often you find the most interesting questions are for pe from people who come at this from a completely fresh perspective. Um, rather than professional scientists, because they so often ask the really fundamental questions that make you think, God, do I even understand this properly myself? And yeah, that's a great question. Ooh. And can I really explain it rather than just describing it? So I, I love it when people get in touch. I really hope some people do after this. Well, very good. Well, Nessa, thank you for coming. It's been a good call. It's been great to talk to you, Richard. Thanks very much. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts 
you may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.